Hi, my name is Mitch, and today we're going to be moving on to our 31st presidential biography. And that, of course, means we're going to be discussing our 31st president, Herbert Clark Hoover. So, Herbert Clark Hoover was born in the town of West Branch, Iowa, on August 10th, 1874, his parents being named Jesse and Holda. Now, unfortunately, uh, Herbert's father, Jesse, died of a heart attack when he was just six years old, when Herbert was just six years old. And, and even more unfortunately, three years later, he was left completely orphaned when his mother, Holda, died from pneumonia. Now, this left Herbert to live with several relatives uh, in, in Iowa, even in uh, Oklahoma for a time with the Native American relatives. And then finally, he ended up with his uncle in Newburgh, Oregon. So quite a bit of moving on, quite a bit of change for a young boy who I believe was just around uh, not even 10 years old yet. Now, naturally, because of uh, the amount he moved around as a child, he studied at several schools uh, in the different areas he lived in. Uh, this was before he entered Friends Pacific Academy in Newburgh. Now, he struggled in this kind of uh, secondary institution. He still persevered, really, uh, and um, really focused on going to college. He ended up enrolling at the, you know, obviously very prestigious Stanford University in California in 1891. Now, there he majored in geology. Uh, but he also served at various points in his college career as the class treasurer, the manager of the football and baseball teams, and as a clerk in the registration office. So he was a very busy student, very busy uh, while he was at Stanford. Uh, and these extracurriculars kind of shaped him into the man he was. Some say more so than his actual classes did. Now, during the summers, he also interned for several geological surveys. So he was busy all year round and getting. Uh, very much, uh, very, very much social networking, I guess you could say, in the field of geology. Now, while at Stanford, he met his future wife, Lou Henry, who was another geology major. I believe she was actually the only female geology major at Stanford. Uh, and the two were married in 1899. They had two children together, Herbert Charles, uh, who would eventually serve actually as the Undersecretary of State, and Alan Henry, who became a mining engineer, just like his father. Uh, Alan Henry had a very long life and very much uh, dipped his toes into a bunch of different fields. Also, writing was another big profession of his. Now, after graduating from Stanford, Hoover began working for a gold mine outside of Nevada City, California. Um, though he, this wasn't, you know, his dream position. It was a good job for him right out of college. And he remained there until he got a job as a mining engineer uh, with, a, with a company based in California. But this company actually sent him to several places around the globe. First, he was sent to Australia, and then he was sent to China. So while he was sent to China, or uh, while he was sent to Australia, he married his wife, uh, and the two were, went to China together. Now, shortly after they moved to China, the Boxer Rebellion broke out. Uh, so if you watch the uh, McKinley video, we discuss how the, the Boxer Rebellion was a, uh, was a kind of like a protest by native Chinese who disliked the foreign influences that were coming into China as a result of things like the, uh, the open door policy, where each country should be able to have uh, equal trade with China. And China was a very isolationist place. And so uh, this movement rose up in China uh, to resist foreign influence. And that resulted in the Boxer Rebellion, which was kind of like an armed conflict uh, by this rebellion to, uh, to curtail foreign influences coming in. And it was very violent. Uh, and it was not until an international coalition came together to end it in 1901. So the Hoovers, shortly after they moved to China, get trapped during the uh, Boxer Rebellion. And so, as they were Americans, as they were foreign, uh, as they were, they were really kind of, uh, they were foreigners in this conflict, in this very armed and dangerous conflict, 
um, Hoover, uh, Herbert Hoover ended up supporting the defense of Tianjin, which is the city he was uh, kind of based in, uh, with the help of many other Westerners. So he helped form this coalition to kind of defend the city of Tianjin against the rebellion. Uh, and, and his wife, Lu, actually served as a nurse uh, for people who were injured during it. Now, after the rebellion ended, Hoover began working in a number of capacities for different minds around the world. Uh, this took him to many, many countries, the most prominent being Burma, which is now Myanmar, Russia, uh, and the United Kingdom. So he went kind of all over the place uh, and was even based in London for uh, a lot of uh, many years during this period. Now, by the time World War I broke, breaks out in 1914, Hoover is a prominent American businessman working out of London, England. Uh, so, as such, he is uh, a Westerner when this kind of European conflict, in fact, America, you know, is not involved and doesn't get involved for another three years. So Hoover's kind of left over here in England while there's this massive great war going on. And so as such, she organizes a committee with several other wealthy businessmen. And this is to provide for the evacuation of nearly 100,000 Americans stuck in Europe. And so um, while he, he is supported, you know, in, in, uh, in semantics by the, gover by the American government, he actually organizes this relief mission entirely on his own with these other businessmen. So outside of the uh, government influence. Uh, and he does this completely by himself with these other businessmen. Now, uh, shortly thereafter, their Germany, uh, which is one of the leaders of the, uh, the Allied powers in 1914, um, Germany, along with Austria-Hungary, they invade, Germany invades Belgium, uh, which spurs a food crisis in that country. Uh, and this prompts Hoover, again, to use his influence, use his power, really, to establish the Committee for the Relief of Belgium. Now, again, though we have the cooperation of the American and the Belgian governments, he raises these millions and millions of dollars without the actual financial or practical support of these countries uh, and provides for the food and health, provides for food and health supplies for the struggling Belgians almost entirely by himself. Uh, by raising this money uh, through his organizations. Now, after the United States enters the war in 1917, Hoover is a very well-known figure in Europe. Uh, during the war, uh, he's, very, he's kind of like a national hero in a way. And so after the U.S. enters the war in 1917, President Wilson appoints Hoover as the director of the Food Administration. Now, in this position, Hoover is, Hoover's job is to ensure that the United States would conserve its food supply in order to bolster the war effort. It was the famous, uh, it really, I guess, infamous, you know, uh, uh, need for there to be rationing, for, for uh, Americans to try and conserve what they were using in order for it to be used for the soldiers fighting in Europe. And Hoover does this very successfully. Uh, he, he very much, um, you know, launches a massive campaign to improve rationing, to bolster rationing, and it works very well and definitely helps the war effort as the war ends in less than a year. Now, that can't be obviously all attributed to Hoover, but uh, Hoover's efforts definitely aid the war effort in many ways. Now, after the war's conclusion in 1918, Hoover is appointed to lead the European Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. So what this was, what this was uh, the point of this was that Europe was devastated by the Great War. M m much of the continental land mass was devastated by the war. And Hoover, Hoover's job is to oversee an immense number of American supplies being sent to nations requiring relief. Uh, so this was kind of his job throughout the whole war, you know, is to provide relief for these struggling countries in the wake of this great global conflict. Now, after a uh, continuing, continuing on until the end of the Wilson administration, Hoover plays a large role in the president's post-war activities and really the reorganization of Europe. Now, uh, he also, after the, the Wilson administration comes to an end, or, or really during the end of the Wilson administration, he creates a library at his alma mater, Stanford, and this houses many records um, from his time during World War I. And this is how we're actually able to uh, keep, we're able, we're able to know so much about Hoover's actions during the war because of his efforts in preserving it. 
uh, in preserving these documents and these records of what what occurred there. Uh, and they're actually, I believe, still still there today. This library is is with a different name, I believe now, but it's still in existence today at Stanford. So for his role in the Great War, Hoover becomes a massive contender for the Republican presidential nomination in 1920. He's an extremely popular national hero, whereas the President Wilson is just absolutely reputation is tarnished. Uh, he suffers a stroke. It's over. So Hoover, the Republicans gain massive influence. Eventually, though, Hoover loses the nomination to the Ohio Senator Warren Harding, as Warren Harding was kind of like a compromise who didn't really uh, make too many enemies. Uh, and so, however, with Warren Harding winning the general election that year, he actually appoints Hoover the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, and now retaining the office, uh, well, okay, so after Harding dies in 1923, Hoover retains the position of Secretary of Commerce throughout much of the Coolidge administration as Calvin Coolidge, the vice president, takes over. And in this position, Hoover oversees the regulation of new industries, uh, increased trade opportunities for American businesses, so increasing America's position on the world stage and their ability to trade with foreign powers, and really furthers the status of his department as commerce had been kind of this overlooked uh, department, and it is again today, really. Uh, but but during the Hoover era, the Department of Commerce skyrockets into one of the most prominent departments in the executive branch. And so Hoover is actually the only Secretary of Commerce ever to become president because of how influential he was in this position. Now, his, position, his popularity increases when he oversees the relief efforts following a series of flood of the Mississippi River in 1927. So whereas Coolidge himself, the president, was very slow to act on the floods, Hoover gets right in there and provides relief uh, as he, you know, he was nicknamed the great humanitarian for his efforts in the, in the war and in, uh, it, again, in the Mississippi River floods, uh, reorganizing Europe, all of these different, uh, all of these different, you know, all these different accomplishments bolster him into having this title as the great humanitarian. And that will bring us to the election of 1928. So in 1928, Coolidge, uh, President Coolidge says that he will not run again, that uh, six years or whatever, uh, yeah, six years is enough for anyone to be president uh, and that he does not feel like he should serve another term also based on Washington's precedent. He's also suffering from his son's death. So Coolidge is done and Hoover becomes this kind of, uh, perfect candidate. He was uh, an almost uh, eight, almost eight year, uh, almost, or sorry, almost seven year uh, Secretary of Commerce. He was uh, a war hero in many ways. Uh, he, he had this great reputation about him. He was a very likable guy. So he becomes the nominee. Interesting fact about this is that his running mate is Charles Curtis. And Charles Curtis is actually a uh, one eighth, I believe, uh, some percentage Native American. And so when, when Hoover and Curtis end up winning the election, uh, Curtis becomes the first person of color to be the vice president. So the, the Hoover ticket is already very historic in that we have the first secretary of commerce to be, to be running for president and the first person of color to be running for vice president. On the other side, we see another historic ticket, which is Alfred Smith uh, of New York, I believe. And Alfred Smith is a Catholic. And Catholics in the early 20th century were not trusted. And this was part of the part of the Red Scare in that people were afraid of the ideas that Catholics brought over uh, from places like Italy uh, and Southern Europe, Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, and so this, this Red Scare kind of uh, uh, brings about this further fear of Catholics. Uh, and so um, it was very hard for Catholics to be elected at the time, but Alfred Smith ends up being the Democratic nominee for president. But as a Catholic, um, he is, and in the wake of the success of the Coolidge administration, the Democrats have very little chance here. And Hoover wins by one of the greatest landslides in history in both the Electoral College and the popular vote. Now, Hoover takes office 
pledging to mostly stay the course regarding Coolidge's and even uh, Harding's policies. Uh, and this was basically to this was basically a hands off policy. You know, Coolidge's whole thing was that the the market can sort itself out. You know, it was the job of the market to decide its own prices and not for the government to step in. And this kind of laissez faire policy worked for Harding and it worked for Coolidge. But unfortunately, that prosperity it brought during the warring, Roaring Twenties came to an end with Hoover. Now, Hoover makes a great blunder in the beginning of his administration when he declares that his belief that the country would soon triumph over poverty. Now, looking back, we think, we say that is one of the, uh, the most backwards, most uh, um, ridiculous things that was ever said. But at the time, it looked, it looked like that was the case. You know, the country was experiencing a rapid economic growth never seen before. But with this rapid economic growth, with this rapid boom, there has to be a bust at some point. And so Hoover's notion that the country was going to triumph over poverty comes to an end with the onset of the Great Depression. Uh, and this is largely brought on by overspeculation. And overspeculation took place a lot during the Coolidge administration and spilled over to Hoover. And so overspeculation was when stock prices would be, uh, would be raised far beyond their actual value in the belief that they would reach that actual value in some time. Now, this over speculation pushes them to almost double or triple what their actual value is. And the, the, the time it would take for the prices to, or for the value to actually reach those prices was very, was a very long period of time. And when prices begin to fall, many call in their debts which forces others to then sell their stocks, which then brings down the market. Because when people sell their stocks for their actual value, they lose a lot of money. Um, they, they lose a lot of money in that investment. And this crashes the stock market, which culminates on October 29th, 1929, a date we know as Black Tuesday. This is the convenient date when we say the Roaring Twenties ended and the Great Depression began even though really throughout the earlier months of 1929, the Great Depression kind of begins, but October 29th, 1929 is our convenient one day that the Great Depression began, even though that's not entirely true. Now, this culminates in the greatest stock market crash to that point in American history, and adjusted for inflation, I believe that actually is still the worst stock market crash in American history. Uh, and so naturally, this causes this great economic crisis that river, reverberates throughout the entire world and brings down uh, the economies of many of the great powers in the world. Now, in the wake of this crash, Hoover actually gets right to work. So whereas many people say he was inactive and didn't do enough to, to address the, the crisis, he actually gets right to work in meeting with business and labor leaders, attempting to avoid layoffs and wage reductions. So he attempts to assure these leaders that the depression is a momentary setback. We're going to get right back on track and right moving again where we were before. And that if we can just keep our wages the way, the, the, how they were and not lay people off, we will get right back on track. He also oversees a reduction in income tax rates. So during the Wilson administration, you know, income tax income tax becomes a real, real federal uh, institution. And so during the next three administrations, income tax rates are lowered in order to, uh, in order to, you know, aid uh, American families in being able to pay for their, uh, and, able, and able to be, buy American goods. He also sees over an increase in public work spending in order to uh, provide jobs in that manner. And also financial aid to businesses. So we actually institute, with the help of Congress, several policies directly to help Americans who are suffering. However, he does oppose direct federal aid to the unemployed. So he doesn't believe in handouts. Um, and this is, is, this, is, uh, this is his belief that – this stems from his belief that doing so would eliminate individual responsibility and that it would make it too difficult or not necessary – for people to uh, work. And this is still 
an issue today. It happened during the coronavirus. And so it's the same sentiment Hoover had. Now, this ends up biting him in the butt, and we will talk about that a little bit more going forward. Now, Congress has a different solution. And in 1930, they pass, and Hoover begrudgingly signs the Smoot-Hawley tariff. These two guys in the back are Senators Smoot and Hawley, which the bill is named after. Now, the Smoot-Hawley tariff raises rates dramatically, actually to the highest they had ever been at that point. Uh, and so this was intended to bolster the American market, make foreign goods more expensive so people have more of an incentive to buy and make American products. Now, this, like all tariffs to this point, terribly backfires and results in many other nations also raising their tariff rates, which thus reduces sales of American goods abroad. So it actually only hurts the sale of American products when it was an attempt to bolster it. So the Smoot-Hawley tariff backfires and Hoover is, 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 is the scapegoat for it. He becomes completely to blame for it. Um, and again, we're going to talk about that very much on the next slide. Now, because of the president's staunch opposition to direct handouts, direct aid, many people end up blaming him directly. And so as a result of their unemployment, many people lose their homes uh, and set up temporary houses together, uh, which the, in these temporary houses together for makeshift villages in several major cities. This is a Hooverville, as they became known on the left-hand side here. These, and these villages become known as Hoovervilles as a blow to the president, who many regarded as directly responsible for their continued suffering, as many people saw him as inactive and not doing enough to aid American families and American individuals. One of the most famous Hoovervilles is actually set up on Central Park in New York City. Uh, so it's a blaringly obvious um, representation of the suffering of the time. At the same time, buildings like the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building are being constructed. And they, can, they are, are extremely visible from Central Park. And so seeing these massive skyscrapers, which are the largest buildings in the world, and are, are symbols of luxury, while these people are living in slums in Central Park, shows the disconnect between the elite and these, the unemployed at the time during the Great Depression. And it becomes kind of emblematic of the, of the feeling of the emotions of the Hoover era. Now, in 1924, uh, Congress had distributed bonuses uh, to World War I veterans that were eligible for redemption in 1945. So these were like, these were basically pensions for World War I veterans for their service in the war, uh, and that they could redeem them, they could get paid back for their service in 1945. Now, the problem was 1945 was 30 years, almost 30 years after the war comes to an end. And many of these veterans felt that on top of that, the Great Depression made it so that they could not survive until 1945. Thus, many of them organized a march in Washington, D.C. in May of 1932, demanding their bonuses be paid immediately. Now, if Congress had complied, we probably never would have heard about this. We probably never would have talked about this event. But... Congress refuses to pay them back and says they must wait until 1945. Thus, many, some go home, but many of these veterans remain in protest, uh, with, saying that basically, we served our country, we put our lives on the line, we fought in some foreign land we were never, ever thought of going to. And now we have to wait another 12 years, another 13 years to be paid for our service. And so they stayed in protest on the National Mall, uh, right outside the White House, right outside the Capitol. And this very much agitated the president, who felt that, the, that it was con Congress had made this pension only to be paid back in 1945, and that that should be respected, as Congress said so. So in kind of a blunder, Hoover orders the U.S. Army to remove these marchers. So General Douglas MacArthur, who becomes a war hero during World War II and the Korean War, uses brutal tactics uh, to remove these protesters. 
uh, and some of them leave with they they use tear gas. They use uh, they point bayonets at them. This is a a, a picture of a uh, co- of a conflict of a of a you know of a skirmish between them of the army and the protesters on the National Mall. And this kind of event just ruins the president's image that much more and makes him appear even more insensitive. I mean, your argument was that these men served our country and now we're using the army to remove them from our nation's capital. Just seems totally backwards and totally bizarre, however justified it was. And so that just further ruined Hoover's image in the public's eyes. So naturally, with this sentiment, with the bonus march, with the Great Depression, Hoover loses the election of 1932 to Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, This is a picture of Hoover attending Roosevelt's uh, inauguration on the right-hand side here. The famous story about this picture is that they had to ride in this car the whole procession and that they didn't say one word to each other because they just disliked each other that much. Now, after retiring, Hoover returns to his home in Palo Alto, California, but he's actually relatively on the young side for presidents. He's only in his 50s here. So with this in mind, he launches a successful, or, uh, sorry, he, he launches a writing campaign against his successor, Roosevelt's New Deal programs, which we will talk about more during the Roosevelt video. Uh, so he kind of, you know, continues on attacking Roosevelt's actions as being too, uh, too far, too, too far to the left, really, and not too, too, you know, socialistic, I guess you could say. Now, he also embarks on a tour of Europe in 1938, and he infamously meets with the German dictator Adolf Hitler, who, of course, we'll talk about more in the next video. Now, he feels Hitler is dangerous after this meeting. This, this meeting. He actually believes he's somewhat insane, maybe rightfully so, rightfully not so. Uh, but he does not think that, who, that Hitler poses a threat to America, and thus that the uh, America should not enter World War II, which breaks out the following year. So he thinks Hoover is a terrible human being. He thinks he's doing terrible things to the Jews in his country and other minority groups. But he does not think America should get involved in the war as he thinks he has, he believes Hitler poses no threat to America at large. Now, obviously, this changes with the attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii in 1941. And Hoover, when when the U.S. enters World War II, Hoover is uh, appointed to chair an international committee that provides relief for Poland, Belgium and Finland. So he kind of acts in a similar manner as he did during World War One. Now, beginning in 1946, during the Truman administration, Hoover serves as a coordinator of the flood supply, or sorry, food supply for world famine, uh, and was active in the reorganization of Europe in the wake of the war. So he actually gets, during the war and after the war, he actually plays a large role in the Truman administration's efforts in reorganizing the continent and helping those suffering in the wake of the war. Again, similar to his actions during the first conflict. Now, in 1947, Hoover is named chairman of the Commission on the Organization of the Executive Branch of Government, a mouthful of a title. Uh, But basically, his job is to assess the Executive Branch of the United States and see if there is any way he could reorganize it to make it more efficient. Now, to many, Hoover's recognition of the increased role the president must play in post-war America was a shocking uh, reversal of his positions during the Roosevelt administration. So during the Roosevelt administration, he attacks the New Deal. He attacks many of his policies in being too, uh, in him being coming too powerful and the presidency becoming too powerful. But during his time on this commission, he realizes that the president does play an increased role and must play an increased role in the atomic age, in Cold War America. And so Truman actually accepts many of his proposals, but Hoover does find himself at odds with Truman over his Cold War policies, Truman being a Democrat and obviously Hoover being a Republican. This leads to a staunch support of of, of Hoover supporting all of the presidential Republican candidates staunchly during the election leading up to his death. So this included Thomas Dewey in 1948, uh, Dwight Eisenhower eventually in 1952 and 1956, 
less so, not not as much Richard Nixon in 1960, and Barry Goldwater in 1964, the year he dies. Now, he dies on October 20th, 1964, in New York City of colon cancer, and was buried at pres his now presidential museum in his hometown of West Branch, Iowa. This is actually a picture I took of the building in which Hoover died, the Waldorf Astoria in Manhattan, uh, just this year, actually. Uh, and so he was residing there for some time uh, in his retirement. And so he actually passed away in this building. And that's going to do it for our video on Herbert Hoover. Next time, we're going to focus on his successor, Franklin Roosevelt. So you can look forward to that. Thanks for watching.